do them. So it's Parent Monday announcement. As you bring your donations in, if they're clothing, shoes, handbags, things like that, leave them under the coat rack. If they're the other items mentioned, some things like diapers, feminine products, hygiene items, we'll set a table up here in the sanctuary where those items be placed. The second announcement is we are having a pizza and movie again today over lunch. We're watching a more adult type drama today after worship if you want to join us in the library. But Betsy needs a count before she orders lunch. So if you're staying for pizza, please raise your hand. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, at least eight of us. Okay? Thank you so much. Perfect. Um, please join me for the call to worship. Give praise to God the Almighty, by whose great mercy we have been born anew to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. We gather yeah, together to praise God for the gift of eternal life as revealed to us through Christ our risen Lord. Please pray with me. Thank you, God, for our lovely lives because we know you made them perfect. For those reasons, we follow you faithfully through and through. Amen.
that in the ministry to which you have called us, we may serve you in holiness and truth. You have taught us that all our deeds without love are worth nothing. Send your Holy Spirit and power into our hearts that the most excellent gift of love, the very bond of peace and of all goodness. Hear our humble prayers of confession now and forgive us. of the sins that wound us, wound others, and wound God. Now, through the gift of grace, we are healed. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks, Thanks be to, to God. God. <clears throat> Please say the affirmation of faith with me. We believe, believe that, that in Jesus Christ, God, God was reconciling the world to himself. Jesus, Jesus Christ is God with us. He is the eternal Son of the Father, who became man and lived among us to fulfill the work of reconciliation. He is present in the church by the power of the Holy Spirit to continue and complete his mission. This work of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is the foundation of all confessional statements about God, humanity, and the world. Therefore, the church calls us to be reconciled to God and to one another.
As we continue to worship and lift our voices using the words of Scripture, I encourage you to join me as we responsibly lift up the words written for Psalm 138. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. Before the gods, I will sing your praise. I will bow down toward your holy temple and will praise your name for your love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. And when I called with your answer to you made me bold and I started. May all the kings of the earth praise you, O Lord, when they hear the words of your mouth. May they sing the praise of the Lord, for the glory of the Lord is great. This morning we are going to look to a gospel lesson from the Gospel of Matthew. And hear a little bit more about how Jesus is preparing his disciples for their formal ministry. So before we turn to that, please join me in prayer. Let's pray together. Creator God, we are grateful that you are Lord of all, that you have made promises and kept those promises to your people, that you came to dwell among us, fully human and fully divine in Jesus Christ. We are grateful for the gift of your Holy Spirit still working among us to allow us to understand your word, to be equipped for ministry, to be prepared for whatever lies ahead. Guide us as individuals, as a congregation, as the church, as the body of Christ, to best reflect your love and grace to all people. We ask now that through your spirit, that your words speak to us, that we learn, that we grow, that we are challenged, and that we are able to better share the good news with others. We ask this all giving thanks in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So this morning, we're going to turn to the Gospel of Matthew. If you're following along in the Pew Bible, that's page 972. We're in Matthew chapter 16, beginning with verse 13. I expect this will be a familiar passage to you, but I hope this morning that through the Holy Spirit, more so than through what I have to say, you will learn something new. Hear these words. When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? The disciples replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But what about you, Jesus asked, who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by my father in heaven. And I tell you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not overcome it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. So as I look at this passage, I'm reminded and have to re-remind myself every time I read scripture that we have the gift of hindsight. You know, the totality of Jesus' relationship with his disciples, what he teaches them, how they respond. But at this point in the narrative, they don't know what happens next. <laughs> at this point in history, they are still discovering what's going on. I like to say they're still getting their sea legs. They're still figuring this out. And this kind of bold lesson comes from Jesus. The same way you or I would kind of check in with people as we're giving them instructions. So if you've ever been a parent, an aunt, an uncle, a teacher, a camp counselor, someone who's had to give instructions to a group of people who are novices or younger or just learning, we all know that it's better to give instructions kind of in, in piecemeal and smaller pieces and then to wait to make sure people respond and hear it. So I teach EMT classes, that's my side hustle, you know, all these fun things to do on the side. So I find a lot of levity and joy in working with the next generation of first responders and helping teach CPR and stop the bleed and other things with them. And we do something in EMT class that's called closed loop communication. 
I found myself even using that word this morning in our mission community meetings. This is part of the vernacular of first responders. Closed loop communication is, if I give you an instruction, I don't move on to the next step until I hear you repeat the instruction back to me. So for instance, if I'm at an emergency scene with an ambulance, if I turn to the other first responder and say, please get the oxygen bag, that responder says, I will get the oxygen bag. That's a closed loop. I've said an instruction, they've heard it and said back, and I know they said the right thing. Compared to me saying, get the oxygen bag, and then just going inside and no one responded and it never comes in, or get the oxygen bag and the person says, I'll go get the first aid kit. Well, that's not what I asked for. So we talk about closed loop communication, and it's a good thing to practice, because when you're in a scenario that's highly stressful, or maybe emotional, or even dangerous, like at a fire scene or a car accident, and it might be loud and distracting, other people are shouting instructions, it's important for you and your partner to communicate effectively. That same thing can be applied to a classroom setting, even to a household setting with our coworkers. It seems kind of pedantic and almost you know, rudimentary to say, go get me something, and then we've got a person to say, I will go get it. But when you do it, then you know it gets done. It's not like these instructions are lost into the air. And so I've learned to do that in first response. I've also applied that to things in the church and in my household as a parent, as a friend, as a colleague, as a sister and daughter in my life. And sometimes it can feel a little bit forced, but then you know people heard you and they acknowledged you. It doesn't guarantee they're gonna do what you ask them to do, but if they don't, it's on them, not on you, <laughs> because the communication happened effectively. So Jesus now is trying to do communication with his disciples in a closed loop. He has been showing them who he is. He has spent over a year with them, walking, talking, preaching, performing miracles, having confrontations with people who disagree with him. He has said bold things and done bold things. He has done everyday life walking, sleeping, eating, chit-chatting with them, as well as these supernatural miraculous things, like healing people, and profoundly speaking God's word against what maybe religious leaders are saying, to the contrary of what he's teaching. So they've seen the full gamut of who Jesus is as a human, and how he is fully divine. And now he's checking in with them to make sure that not only have they witnessed and experienced this, but they understand why it's all happening the way it is. So he checks in with the students and he says to them directly, who do you think I am? Who do people say that I am? And when he asks these questions, it's kind of lost, as I've shared with you in the English sometimes, but in the Greek, when he says, who do you say that I am? It's more like he's saying, who do y'all say that I am? I mean, y'all isn't a word in Greek, but it's kind of this plural understanding. So he's not saying specifically, Chuck, who do you think I am? Or Betsy, who do you think I am? He's saying collectively, everybody in the room, who do you think I am? And the interesting thing is at first, he gets an everybody in the room answer. We don't know what disciple says what, but amongst the 12 of them, they give some answers. They say, oh, some say you're a prophet, some say you're John the Baptist, some say you're Elijah, some say you're Jeremiah, there's all these answers. And then he responds again and says, no, who do you, who, who the people right here sitting in front of me think that I am? And then Peter snatches up the response. Throughout scripture, we see that Peter tends to be the other side of these communication loops. He is kind of like the spokesperson on behalf of all the other disciples. And depending on what theological lens you read that through, some people lift Peter up and say, what a great spokesman and leader. How bold of him. He always answers. I kind of read it and go, how annoying. Peter always speaks up for us and doesn't let anyone else talk. <laughs> Peter's the one who's like, pay attention to me. I'm a good job. I'm a good student. He's the teacher's pet. He wants Jesus to recognize him. But Peter always closes that loop. He always responds. He was it's not always the right response, but he's always the other side of this conversation lifted up. So now Peter responds to this question of who do you all, collectively, all 12 of you, who do you say that I am? And thankfully, Peter very declaratively and confidently says, I am confident that you are Christ. You are the anointed Messiah. You're the one that was promised to us by God. That's an amazing declaration. That's an amazing thing to say. That's a very strong faith statement. And then Jesus praises him and says, you're, not, you're right. And as a result of being right, there's a reward. 
So you were a dutiful student who paid attention, you got the answer right, and as a reward, I'm gonna give you the keys to the kingdom. Now, I always struggle with reading this because I want a list of keys. I want it to list, here's the keys, one, two, three. This key opens this door, this key opens that door, this is the key to this. It doesn't say that. It just generically says the keys to the kingdom. And then we try to interpret what that may mean. Probably the best interpretation I've ever heard is it's similar to giving the key to the city. So if you do something remarkable, like win a race, or save a life, or tell something very philanthropic. They might invite you down to City Hall and say ceremoniously, here's this giant metaphorical key to the city. You know, you're our ambassador, you're our representative, you're our champion of who we are as a community. And probably the best representation of what the keys to the kingdom are. Jesus doesn't give Peter or anyone else a specific key to open a specific door. But he says metaphorically, you now have access to the fullness of God's kingdom in the here and now. He said, because you've made this bold, foundational, confessional statement about who Jesus is, you now have full access to what that can mean as God attempts to give us a glimpse of the heavenly kingdom in the here and now. Many people have looked at this and said, great, what a good student Peter is. He closed the loop of communication, he gave the right answer, he affirmed what was going on, his teacher complimented him, affirmed him, rewarded him, he got the golden star for the day. That should be the end of this. But then Jesus continues and says, but now you have a responsibility. Now that you confidently know who I am, now that you know I'm not Jeremiah, I'm not John the Baptist, I'm not Elijah, I'm not some other prophet or even some charlatan snake oil salesman pretending to be who I claim to be. Now that you are confident about who I am, you need to realize that that confidence did not come from anything that you came up with yourself. That can kind of seem depleting. So, yes, Peter, you have the right answer. Here's the gift of access and celebrity. You did everything right. But wait, you didn't really do it yourself. Because, he says, this is not something that in your own humanness, in your own intellectual observation, you can confidently declare. What you're declaring is supernatural reality. So it needs to come from a supernatural source. So yes, you made the human observations of seeing and hearing and engaging in what I did. Jesus says, you saw me do miracles, you heard me preach. You watch my day-to-day -day life and realize I'm the same guy behind the scenes as I am in the public eye. I'm a consistent follower of the one true God. He said, now you need to realize that your confidence in declaring that I am the Christ, Jesus says, that only comes from the fact that God has enabled you to have the faith you need for that. That is a supernatural statement. That is a holy foundational statement. And he says to Peter, not even the gates of Hades can overcome this. So again, kind of lost on us because of the Greek and the culture. But in other words, death cannot vanquish this. What you are saying is so strong and confident. What you're saying is so true that even the power of death cannot squelch or silence that reality. So even if Peter dies, this truth remains. Even if all the disciples that morning are struck dead, it wouldn't change the truth that Jesus is the Christ. It would hamper the spreading of that truth, but it would not change that truth. And then he says to Peter, you are the rock upon which I will build my church. Now, throughout the last 2,000 years, there's been conversations about what does that mean? Some of our Christian brothers and sisters, those in the more orthodox tradition, those who worship up the street, for instance, at the Ukrainian Center or at the Byzantine Catholic Center, those who worship in Roman Catholic congregations, interpret that to be that Peter as an individual person is the one upon which Christ is building his church. And have to the best of their ability, proceeded to then pass down that leadership through people who directly have met Peter. So Peter and the people he trained and the next generation of trainees, on and on and on, to lead to the bishops, the pope, the other leaders in the church. There's a way that they can directly trace back an ancestry 
that all these people learn from each other, serve with each other, worship with each other. In some way, there's a direct connection from the current leadership of the Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches all the way back to the person of Peter. That's a vowed endeavor to figure out how to do that. And that's not necessarily wrong. But what we, as members of the Reformed or Protestant branches of the Christian family tree believe, is that it wasn't so much that Peter, the human person, was the foundation, but Peter's confessional statement is the foundation. So Peter declares, Jesus, you are the Christ. And that is the rock upon which our faith is built. That declaration that Jesus is the Christ is the actual rock, instead of Peter, the person, being the rock. And therefore, any church and any person who makes that de declaration, that statement, can trace their faith lineage all the way back to this encounter of Peter making this statement on behalf of y'all, on behalf of all of the disciples in Jesus' presence. So I don't know about you, but I have no way to trace myself back to the original Peter. I know who my great-grandparents were, but that's about as far as I can trace. We probably can't do that. We don't have that kind of heritage family tree faith endued in us because we, as followers of Christ in the way and tradition we do, believe is foundational upon a faith statement, not a particular person or a lineage. So there is a little bit of a difference and a friction in that understanding, but it leads us to the same place of declaring that Christ is who he claims to be. And that truth is foundational. So the uniqueness in that is, Jesus says to Peter, this is the rock upon which I will build my church. Okay, so a rock is something that is firm, that is sturdy, that creates a strong foundation. We sing hymns like how firm a foundation. We talk about how Jesus has this parable about building you know, a house on the rock rather than the sand that will get washed away. You and I know that if you have a house that has a foundation, it's less likely to fall over or blow away. You know, we understand this, that a firm foundation for anything to center it and ground it is an important reality to that it doesn't get knocked over or dismantled or fail. <coughs> so the foundational statement that Jesus Christ is Lord is what the church is built upon. And you can't waver from that. And that is unique to the Christian church. So there are many things in our world that do care for others, philanthropy, genuine, empathetic, sympathetic outreach that do things for the betterment of people. If I sat here, many of you are even members of or contributors to such organizations. You can talk about the great work the local PTO does, or the great work the Girl Scouts and Boy Scouts do, the great work of the Red Cross, of FEMA, of many other organizations we're involved with. You can talk about your own philanthropy of giving money to someone you know in need. You can talk about things like the Rotary Club and the Kiwanis Club and the Eastern Star and all these organizations that do amazing work to care for people, to improve their well-being, to make them independent, to give them dignity, to provide for their everyday needs, the things that Jesus talks about, clothing, food, shelter, dignity, respect, the identity to be a child of God. But the uniqueness of the church is that, yes, we do those things as well, but we only do those things because of foundation, the statement that Jesus Christ is Lord. You are not going to read that in the Girl Scout Charter. You're not going to read that in the Kiwanis Charter. You're not going to read that at the Red Cross. They're going to talk about their giving, their philanthropy, their response to disasters and emergencies, all of which is genuine and valid and good to do. But when Jesus turns to Peter and says, your declaration, your confessional statement that Jesus Christ is the Lord, that is upon what we're going to build the church. So everything we do as Christians needs to start there. That's the foundation. You don't build the roof first, then the second story, then the first story of, oh, maybe I should build a basement and a foundation. No, you start at the bottom, and you work your way up. What is visible, though, is what is up. Very few of us live in homes where the foundation is the predominant architectural feature. People don't drive by your house and go, what a great foundation. Now, what beautiful windows, what beautiful colors. Oh, there's gingerbread on the front porch, or look at that new roof. What a great you know, landscape lawn. We know the foundation is there. It's not a secret. But it's not the most predominant architectural feature of any building. 
but it is necessary for the stability and longevity of any structure. So Jesus says, this is the foundation. This is the rock upon which I'm building my church. Everything you do is based on this. So if you're going to give food to someone who is hungry, clothing to someone who is naked, if you're going to visit someone who is in prison, if you're going to offer relief to someone who feels overwhelmed, you're doing that because you have faith and confidence in Jesus Christ as Lord. And if you start there, you're going to succeed. The interesting thing about Peter is he, later on, isn't necessarily a rock or a foundation for the church. Very soon after this interaction, he actually becomes a stumbling block to the church. We read in the events of Holy Week that three times Peter denies even knowing Jesus. Not even saying he's a follower, he's, I don't even know that guy. Who are you talking about? So I don't know if we want to base an entire religion on a guy who three times said, I don't even know who the leader of it is. That's a big change from being this confident originator of this confessional statement. So Peter, just like you and I, is human, gives into temptation and sins. He's imperfect, but he's trying. And the bold statement he makes here on behalf of his brothers, his disciples, is a very foundational and important statement. But it's that statement that remains true, no matter who says it. So I can say to you that I believe Jesus Christ is Lord. But I can also say to you that I make mistakes, that I put my foot in my mouth. I'm not going to ask you to do it right now, but you can ask Natalie about my flaws, and she will give you a list. There are things that I do not do properly, that I do not do maybe that are as genuine and reflective of my following of Christ as they should be. Because you and I, we are all imperfect in this life. But that doesn't change the truth of Jesus Christ being Lord. Jesus is still Christ whether or not I reflect that. Jesus is still the Christ whether or not this church reflects that. But if that foundational statement is lived into, then there's this amazing truth. And so when we as Christians try to live out our faith and we want to know, is there an impact? This is when this kind of closed-loop communication can come back. If I'm going to live and act and speak in ways that are foundationally based on the declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord, then the people I interact with should understand that and somehow pair it back to me that they know that's why I do these things. Now that may directly look like what we think of as traditional evangelism. It may look like standing on a street corner preaching the gospel and having someone come up and say, I believe in Jesus, baptize me right here and now. That would be a very obvious closed loop communication. We declare the good news of salvation in Jesus Christ, and someone who has never believed that before walks by and hears us, the spirit moves, and they say, right now I believe that too. That would be really obvious and a wonderful way to pat ourselves on the back and say, it worked. I said it, they said it back, we're good to go. But that's probably a rare occasion in our encounters with others. When it happens, it's worth celebrating. I wish it would happen more often. But it's more likely that you and I in our daily lives will have opportunities to show forth God's grace, to show forth Christ's compassion and love, to be equipped with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, and show ways like forbearance is one of those gifts, you know, biting our tongue when we could say something foolish, doing different things that show forth that we're a follower of Christ, and we foundationally believe that Christ is Lord. And the affirmation that the Spirit is working in that is when someone says back to us an observation that they notice we are different because of our faith. I know I've been preaching in front of you for 10 years, and I probably told you the story before, but I'm going to tell you again. Maybe you were absent that Sunday. But before I was your pastor, I spent a very brief amount of time being a barista at Panera. So I had served my previous church, and there was a couple weeks in between to you know, move to Elkins Park and get our affairs together where I needed some income. So I'm working at Panera, just being a cashier, barista person, and I didn't hide that I was a pastor by profession, but it wasn't really important when I was serving people lattes and bread. It didn't come off very often. One day, someone did make a comment, because my boss knew, knew my role, he made some sort of comment about church, and a coworker said to me, oh, it makes sense now, that's why you don't swear all the time. <laughs> and I thought, wow, wow. So she had observed that I was different than my coworkers. I wasn't foul-mouthed. But she hadn't put two and two together as to why. 
And at first I was surprised and found it amusing, and then I was brokenhearted. I had kind of wanted to just go clock in and clock out and get through a couple of weeks of work and have a little bit of income, you know, get on with life. And I had missed the opportunity to be more bold about my faith. So a person I worked with, who didn't have any reason to know me otherwise, other than in the workplace, recognized I was different. She had made that observation. And she had wondered and was curious as to why I was different. But I had not given her the answer. Then finally she knew. When the boss let the cat out of the bag, oh yeah, she works at church, you know. Then she put two and two together. But that broke my heart. And as a follower of Christ, I had done a little bit, I kind of set my toe in the water, but I hadn't jumped fully in for this person to understand why my behavior would be different than the behavior of the world at large. So it wasn't closed loop communication. It was I had given an instruction and she paired it back part of it. So it was like if I said to someone, go get your shoes and your backpack, and the person said, I'm getting my shoes. So she heard me. She heard part of my message, but she didn't follow completely the instructions. So Jesus sets up for the disciples and said, this is an amazing confessional statement. It's amazing to be able to declare with confidence, Jesus Christ is Lord, and that's the foundation of my faith. By the end of this, he says, and it seems paradoxical. He says, now don't tell anyone. This is just between us. Can I imagine how confusing that would have been? For Jesus to say, I know people are speculating about who I am. Let's figure out who I am. Oh, Peter, great, you got it right as who I am. I'm going to give you all these spiritual gifts to be able to profess and confess this reality of who I am. But don't do it right away. And Jesus understood that all the disciples were confident in who Jesus was. They weren't yet equipped to share that message effectively. So just like anyone who's unprepared, they would have gone out foolishly and squandered this truth and probably felt very deflated or defeated. So it's as if I said to you, come to my EMT class. Here's an oxygen tank and a first aid kit and an ambulance. See you later. You have all the tools you need, but I didn't train you how to use any of them. Go save a life. You might not kill someone, but you probably wouldn't do a very good job of helping anyone. It would be very haphazard. You'd be learning as you go. It would be to the detriment of appropriate care given for the people you were responding to. But if you're fully prepared before you step out the door, not only with the equipment, but the knowledge and the muscle memory of how to use it promptly and appropriately, you're going to have a much higher success rate. So Jesus says to his followers, you know the truth, the foundation that Jesus Christ is Lord. That's great. That's where we start. We can't get anything else done unless you know that. He said, but now, you need to see that play out. This is not only in his life and ministry, but in your own life. And then, when the time comes, you're going to be doing this without me physically present. And Jesus says, at that point, you can fully declare who I am and reveal who I am. Because at that point, you will be prepared and equipped. It doesn't mean you'll have a 100% success rate in converting people. We know they don't. They get arrested. They get stoned. They get hung upside down on the cross. <laughs> they get martyred. That's certainly not 100% effective and successful. But they have enough impact. And they use enough of their spiritual gifts. Based on that foundational statement that you and I now are Christians today almost 2,000 years later, because there was enough success that that message would pass on. So Jesus says to them, you're still my students. We still have work to do. But the most basic foundational lesson you now confidently believe in and can state and confess, and now we're going to build on that, so that when the time comes, you will be prepared to go out. And at some points have success. Like very famously as Peter walks into the temple in the book of Acts, there's a man begging and he asks for money. And Peter turns to him and says, no, just get up and be healed. And he does. That's a pretty awesome success. To go from being crippled and in need to being restored to full health simply by a man having faith that God would do it for you. So they have amazing success. But at the same time, many of them are persecuted, arrested, and martyred. 
So it's a mixed bag of responses. But they were able to continue and persevere because of this foundational reality that Jesus Christ is who God promised he would be. That he is fully human and fully God. And that he is going to leave them this gift of the Holy Spirit to equip them moving forward. So you and I, to this day, make confessional statements. We do it every single Sunday in our affirmation of faith, which is a different portion of the book of confessions that our denomination has created, which is times in history when Christians thought there was a reason to, again, boldly build on that foundational statement. So Jesus Christ is Lord. How do we live into that? So there's statements like the Apostles' Creed, the Nicene Creed. As recently as we talk about the Confe Brief Confession of Faith from 1983, which I don't think is recent in my lifetime. You know, these things that happen along the way that build up the church and reaffirm our statements of who we are. The Presbyterian Church has just commissioned a group of people to write a confessional statement for this year. One ruling elder and one pastor from our presbytery are sitting on a national committee right now praying and discussing what the church needs to say today to build on that foundational statement that Jesus Christ is Lord. And if that is true, if we believe that, how do we live as people who have a foundation on that statement in 2023? So it'll be interesting to see in the coming months what statement they came up with and how that is presented to the church at large to say this is now how we declare in our modern, present context, how we are living in this foundational declaration that Jesus Christ is Lord. Amen. out of our talent, our time, our treasures, and our testimony, and give a portion of the abundance God has blessed us with to then reallocate through the church and the church leadership discussions and decisions to ensure that we have a building to worship in, that we have staff and programs, and that we have ways to respond to needs that the greater community presents to us. So thank you for your generosity and continued giving. I do want to lift up and remind you, now the second week in a row, we now have a QR code for giving in our uh, bulletin. So if you're not familiar with that, Martha can explain it to you. She's the expert on QR codes. <laughs> but that's a way to give of uh, your financial giving if that's how you would like to respond to your stewardship responsibilities and relationship with our congregation. There are other ways to give of your time, of your talents, and to engage on our committees and ministry, but we thank you for any way you can respond. Please join me in prayer. Almighty God, we are grateful for the call you place upon our hearts and through the affirmation that Peter gave upon the foundation of Jesus Christ as Lord. As we stand on that firm foundation, may we give thanks because everything we have comes from you. Bless the portions of what you have given us, the portions that we set aside as gifts to give back to your ministry. Bless those gifts so that they may glorify you and share your love with all people. We thank you for your guidance and the way you have entrusted us all these blessings. We give you thanks in the name of Christ. Amen.
This morning, as a family of God, we come together to lift our voices in prayer, as well through the week, to in our own personal devotional life, pray for the concerns and the thanksgivings that are lifted up. I have a praise report, good news. Carol Perillo sent me a picture of a baby this morning. So Carol Perillo has a, her first grandchild. So Carol and Joe Perillo are now grandparents to Benjamin. So David and Tiffany welcomed a son yesterday, and everyone is healthy and happy. And I'm sure Carol will appreciate any grandmotherly advice anyone can offer her if she welcomes her first grandchild. And as Joe becomes a grandfather and Matthew becomes an uncle, that's an exciting uh, story to celebrate in the extended family of our church. And baby Benjamin thankfully appeared to be smiling and look cute. I have pictures on my phone if you want to see. <laughs> this morning, are there other prayer updates we'd like to lift up together? Yes, Betsy. My friend Ginny continues on hospice. Thank you. Continued prayers for Betsy's friend Ginny as she's on her hospice care and her journey for what the past days of her life may look like for us. And I will lift up that tomorrow Philadelphia schools are starting. So if you know people who are work for the school or a student, they start tomorrow. Uh, Abington schools start either the fifth or the sixth, depending on what grade students are in. So we ask blessings upon all those who are preparing to head back to school and wake up earlier than they have all summer. <laughs> what happens? Yes, Chris. Gratitude and thanksgiving that although there was an incident at the football game in Abington on Friday night, it was resolved peacefully and everyone is safe. And a student who made a very poor decision is in custody, so we are pleased that that was resolved well and that uh, hopefully it makes people a little bit more aware moving forward to make some better decisions. We are grateful for the safety. Let's pray together. Almighty, creating, healing, and graceful God, we are humbled come before you in prayer. We lift up before you the concerns on our hearts, both spoken and unspoken. We come with joy for new babies, but also for concern for those who are still pregnant awaiting births. Lord, we also lift up families who are growing through adoption and foster care. We lift up those who are serving in different custodial ships. And Lord, we know that your family is broad, that your family looks different in each household, and we are grateful for the ways we even act as a family, as brothers and sisters and caregivers for one another. Thank you, Lord, for those whom we love, those who need comfort, those who need healing, those who are in distress. May we be your presence in their lives, offering the words that are needed, the presence that gives them strength, and the comfort that only your spirit can give. Lord, we thank you for our community. We ask your special blessings of safety and joy and refreshment as students and teachers and school staff get ready to return to the school year. We thank you for the opportunity for engagement and learning, for fellowship, for friendships. And Lord, we ask for your continued safety, your presence, and for our students to come out well-rounded and prepared to enter a world that needs to know your love and grace. Lord, we thank you for the ministry of this congregation, for each person present here, for those who worship with us from home, for those who call this church family their family, even though they may now live far away or be distant from us or simply absent this morning. We thank you for the many connections we have, and we are grateful that you call us your church. We ask that you always remind us of our foundational belief that Jesus Christ is Lord, May everything we do and stay start on that foundation. For we are your disciples whom you taught to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory for us. I invite you as an act of worship to stand if you are able and join me in singing ye servants of God.
refreshment, that kind of casual life, that time of relaxation, and you go out into that opportune and open place, a place that is maybe eager for fellowship and grace and conversation, and go out with the confidence that Jesus is the Christ, the promised Messiah, our Lord, and may your words and actions testify to that truth. Go now with the blessings of God, our Creator, Jesus, our Messiah, and the knowledge of the ever-present, ever-comforting Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.